Here we go. Okay, so the recording is started. Antje, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, and I'll actually hand it over to Elina straight away. Thank you for that. I'm debating whether we should wait an additional few seconds so it hits 11 o'clock on the dot, but saying that it has turned 11. So good morning, everyone, and hello from the Netherlands. Uh, my name is Elina linton Ariens, and I am part of the team at the European Data Portal, otherwise known as the EDP. It's a pleasure to speak with all of you, albeit remotely, with my two colleagues, also from the EDP team, Gianfranco Ciccone, also based with me in the Netherlands, and Antje Kugler in Germany. Apologies that I will not be sharing my video, uh, my bandwidth. Oh, thank you for pinpointing that my mic is too silent. Um, apologies that my video will be off. My bandwidth is a bit low today. So for the sake of clarity, it'll stay off um, and I will make sure to keep my mic in this position so you can hear me clearly. Saying that also going forward, we will all presenters will do our best to keep an active eye on the chat for any questions or issues that you may have, and we will do our best to address it as promptly as possible. So to the agenda of this session. In this workshop, um, the European Data Portal and High Value Datasets, we will be one discussing what the EDP is after having a short interactive session on Slido to see where everyone is. We will then present the Open Data Directive, um, the Directive on Open Data and the Reuse of Public Sector Information, and introduce what High Value Datasets is or are before discussing with you possible High Value Datasets and possible lessons from Inspire before closing and having a summary of our session and checking out with one line or a word before leaving. Before we fully kick off with the workshop, we would like to state again that if you have any questions, do use the chat function. And also this, is, this session is being recorded. So if you do miss anything, this will be available on the Inspire YouTube channel shortly. Now, before starting, we'd like to do a test run of Slido, a platform we will be using for the discussion later for the discussions today. Can everyone please log on to the Slido and type in the hashtag Inspire2020? The furthest instructions are all shown on this slide. And once you are there, can you please answer the question, what country in the world are you in? And please stick to country so we can have a good impression of where you geographically are. We have clear majority so far. our knowledge on this topic with everyone even remotely. I think we can close off the so oh, even more angles are trickling in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it seems the majority of um, our participants seem to be in Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands, France, and the UK. Again, hello to all of you and welcome to our remote um, online session. Now that we have an idea where everyone is in the world, let's get to the workshop. As I stated, oh, I'll allow Ancha to also head back to the PowerPoint. As I stated, my colleagues Gianfranco and Ancha and I will give a short introduction to what the EDP is, present on the Open Data Directive, introduce high value data sets, and we'll have a short discussion afterwards. Firstly, to begin with, the European Data Portal is an EU initiative that aims to improve the accessibility and increase the value of open data across Europe. Here, accessibility is how we can access the information, where we find the data, how the data is made available in the first place, and in what languages they are published and shared in. 
The value here also is, involves looking at the purpose and the economic gain of using the open data and asking questions such as what is the societal gain and what is the democratic gain, for example. What the EDP does is address the whole data value chain from the data publishers to the data reusers. More specifically, we support data publishers in publishing open data and promote awareness on the benefits of open data reuse to encourage users to reuse the data to create services that can generate impact. Before I continue, let me also clarify what open data actually is. Open data is data that can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone, subject only at most to the requirements of attribute and share alike. In its essence, the EDP acts as a single access point to the public sector information from the EU 28 member states and seven additional countries, including Switzerland, Norway, and Ukraine, for example. This means that the EDP is currently harvesting metadata from national open data portals and institutions from 36 countries in Europe. And as of this morning, we have over 1,071,000 data sets available on the portal. In addition, the portal enables users such as yourself to discover the data that they need by making its metadata searchable in 24 EU supported languages and Norwegian. What this means is that when you search for a word such as chicken through the EDP, you will find all the chicken related metadata sets available from all, lang all the supported languages on the portal, such as Poyo, Poye, or Kip. So by using the EDP, you can find different data sets from across Europe on a topic or category that interests you or is relevant to a service that you are creating. As I mentioned earlier, to achieve this, we support publishers and providers in countries across Europe to select and publish good quality data by hosting workshops and consultations with the different open data portals and institutions. In addition, we regularly update the portal to ensure that the published data sets are up to date so that users and developers can have access to and use accurate and reliable data for their ideas and projects. In addition to harvesting these metadata sets and supporting publishing providers, we also are quite active in community engagement. One is by, for example, speaking at conferences such as Inspire 2020. The other is by regularly publishing new article, news articles related to open data and publishing more in more in depth um, pieces that look at open data topics and trends fortweekly. We also have a new section that you can see on this lovely screenshot that is EDP for COVID that shows data stories or uh, examples of open data that um, can contribute to action around COVID-19, as well as COVID-19 initiatives and data sets from different European countries. Uh, and uh, moreover, we also publish reports regularly. One of them, or our most latest one, is on open data best practices in top performing countries in Europe, and a previous one that we wrote and published earlier this year on high value data sets across Europe. But this is a rough and general introduction to what the European data portal is. If you want to explore it further, the link is available here and will also be shared in the slides afterwards. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. I now give the floor to my colleague, John Franco. Thank you, Lina. Can you hear me right? I presume you do. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> and let's share my screen and let's proceed. So I'm going to tell you a bit of a story here. Uh, the uh, First of all, I'm, I have introduced myself just because it's a nice thing to do. My name is Gianfranco Cecconi. Uh, you can tell from my accent and my name. I'm Italian and British, uh, but I live in the Netherlands uh, where I work for Capgemini Invent. It's one of the uh, companies that uh, runs the consortium uh, for the European Commission that operates the European Data Portal for, for you. And, um, I've been, of course, involved more recently in, with my team trying to prepare Europe for something big that is happening uh, next year. And the first question actually is for you, that is, do you actually remember GDPR? Uh, two years ago, on the morning of the 25th of May, uh, a lot changed in Europe. And that perhaps is something that impacted all of us. We changed the way uh, we interact and we work and we process and we store uh, personal information from people uh, in Europe. And again, it's not going to be that big, but we're going to have something major come in July 2021. Uh, a new wave of changes that will impact mostly 
um, uh, public sector. And differently from others, perhaps, I would like to present this to you as an opportunity. This is something that is for you and you can make the best out of it. And we are trying to help you um, making the most of it. So what's going to happen is that the Open Data Directive is going to become enforceable uh, after two years, let's say, of um, a waiting room, as it usually happens with this kind of uh, pieces of legislation. On the 17th of July, uh, all public uh, organizations um, and uh, um, other uh, public undertakings, so companies owned by governments, will be required to publish something called high value data sets. And today we will explain what they are to you uh, so you can um, better understand what, what it means for you. So you should not be surprised. Uh, the, this directive that becomes enforceable next summer is actually the third of a series that has progressively over time uh, pushed the governments to open more and more data. The ones of you who have background in Inspire uh, will not be surprised to the idea of Europe facilitating governments to be more generous in sharing data uh, with their citizens. Um, the interesting bit of the latest one is that it ups the ante a little and it builds on top of a concept that for you, I guess, for most in this audience will not be new, that is open data. Eline introduced uh, this um, just before me. Uh, it's simply data that anyone can access, use and share. And there was a general drive for all member states to publish this for a few years now. What changes in July is that we will also be required, governments will be required to publish in the context of open data, high value data sets that are data sets, their use of which is associated with important benefits for society, the environment, the economy, because they are very suitable for creating value added services, applications, they will create jobs and so on. This is actually the definition that comes from the legislation. And of course, for some of us, we say, oh my God, no, another thing I need to be compliant with, boring. Uh, and yeah, it's true. There, there will be some degree of compliance. The ones of you who work in government, the ones of you who uh, are suppliers to government, perhaps are already involved in trying to prepare to what is going to happen because there will be requirements like um, uh, changing the business model by which you can release this data in the open free of charge. Uh, you will be required to publish the data in machine readable format while well, before perhaps you did not need to and uh, where relevant you will need to publish data you will be required not need you will be required to publish data as apis uh, all of this may be new to, to many of you but i would like rather to invite you to see it as an opportunity so uh, high value data sets will become some kind of flagship data resources that all member states will share uh, we will have around the same data sets uh, falling into this kind of hat and will enable delivering cross-border, cross-industry services that are data-driven that perhaps before were not possible. And again, I'm not expecting a revolution here, but we did not have anything before that was so strong and so heavily supported by law. Now, um, the European Data Portal, of course, because of its uh, mandate from the Commission to support Europe in finding out about open data and, and reusing it more, will definitely have a part in it. And you will hear more from us over time. Um, at the moment, the hybrid data sets are not really even specified in detail. And, and Anche after me will tell you more about that. Um, but it's not just about open data. So the European Commission has been pushing heavily in general to promote better data sharing in Europe, whether it is open or controlled. Uh, and um, together with the European Data Portal, there's another initiative uh, like this one, the Support Centre for Data Sharing, um, that is trying to help you getting more comfortable uh, with any kind of modality, technology and legal implications of, of sharing that you may not be necessarily comfortable with. And perhaps uh, that's two slides from me just to get into the more interactive part of it. Uh, you may start wondering perhaps, okay, perhaps we don't know yet what those high value data sets will be in detail, but at least tell me what do you call value? And you saw the definition from the law. Two more uh, elements of support we can give you are those two reports coming from the European Data Portal. 
one to the left, uh, um, sexually called analytical report number 15, or high value data sets, understanding the perspective of data providers, is a study we've done at the end of last year, working with uh, a few countries in Europe to get their expectations specifically related to uh, today work, uh, they volunteered to help us there, so they described what they would call the high value data sets if they worked autonomously, if they had the choice, what they consider important, how they would they measure that value. In the second report, the one to the right, the economic impact of open data is a major piece of research we developed last year, also available for you, both reports are available on the website for free, um, that describe extensively, qualitatively and quantitatively how you can measure the value of open data created in Europe for the economy, whether in terms of actual businesses or jobs or uh, improvement of the quality of life of people. Uh, so rely on this, they will be giving you amazing examples on how you can, in a way, build up your mind of what to call value. So where we are in the timeline and, and, and why it is interesting now. So we are still in the first phase uh, to the left. So we are still, specifying them. The European Commission at the moment is working on a process by which they are um, I would say, knocking on doors on all member states and uh, public agencies and uh, local administrations through the help of the member states to find out what does, what do, what should this high value data set look like. This process will end sometime in like September, October when um, an implementing act, so-called, will be uh, written that ad uh, adds to the directive the extra specifications of, all, of those high-value data sets that are the same for every member state. Sometime in the winter then, because this is a directive, the uh, countries, each country will have to write their own transposition of the law. So each country, like in my case perhaps the, the Dutch and the Italians, will have their own uh, implementation specifying for Italy and for the Netherlands um, in a way that is compatible with the General Directive and Implementing Act, what those high values should be for their countries. And then a lot of work, particularly for the ones of you who are in industry, will start because you will have to catch up with those specifications and with that legislation. So you will have to start implementing the technology. If the data uh, your country already has is not good enough, for example, or not detailed enough, you will have to change the process by which the data is collected. If the data is not published yet as API, and it is perhaps live data or almost live data, or <laughs> perhaps it's the, the time you will have to do it. And all of this uh, will end up at that um, uh, big date I told you about, the 17th of July, when uh, the law becomes enforceable. So this is the um, summary, uh, and I apologize if I had to go uh, fast, but I believe I covered most of the space. Uh, I'm uh, taking the presentation off temporarily just because I would like to check your questions. Eline, Ansha, how much time have we got now if you want to break for a few questions before we go on to the next stage? We're very good for time. <laughs> okay. okay, it was a bit long the last time we checked, so, mm. so let me see for the question. So far, there seems to be none in the chat, but oh. yeah, I'm trying to find the window now. Mm -hmm. We have one coming in from Marcus. Okay, that's a, that's a very fair one. Um, as a rule of thumb, uh, only pre existing data sets may be identified as high value data sets. So imagine that um, a good example may be perhaps the um, one of my favorite actually. Uh, the um, in some countries already publishes open data, the official gazetteers of cities and uh, street names and postcodes and which house number is in which postcode in which street and so on. Um, this is not open data in the UK. Uh, when I lived there, uh, I was part of, let's say, of the activist movement that wanted this data to be made in the open, uh, but unfortunately we failed. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, this will be recognized as a high value data set um, by the ongoing process. I wish, I wish it was. 
if this data does not exist, I believe you won't be, the countries will not be required to publish it. Uh, it's a sort of a simplification they probably take, took just to complicate, not to complicate too much the lives of the member states. Um, however, I would personally expect probably a second round of this, perhaps the next directive a few years from now, very likely will up the ante even more. Can it be a combination of pre-existing database? So we will see when, when the um, current consultation process uh, finishes, but my our personal our expectation actually is that the data sets will be specified functionally. So it will not be a technical specification like it has to be a table with this column and this column and this column. I expect personally that, that it will be more of a functional description like this data set should enable anybody to check if, a dat if an address is valid. And the response to that functional question would be probably the gazetteer I described earlier. Uh, so if the result of that is a combination of persisting data sets, why not? I mean, from the important point is that it ticks the functional specification. If the coverage is restricted to open data, the national procedure has to be created. Um, interestingly, it's not necessarily about open data. Uh, some of the more interesting potential for high value data set is that some of these may actually not be something you would normally call open data. For example, many are advocating for the register of companies and for company directors to be uh, called high value data sets so it can be used to prevent fraud. But your name as a director of a company is something you may consider a per personal data. So it's, um, in the UK, again, as a good example, this, is op this, this has been open data for years. In other countries, you may not necessarily be that comfortable sharing the names of the company directors. Uh, go back to the questions. So it can be a combination of recovery, state, open data, API, interoperability. Okay. Uh, Mark, you're ambitious. Um, so I believe it's going to be for later. Uh, the, just imagine yourself being uh, at the center of the consultation being running at the moment and trying to persuade in nine months to people to agree on a standard. Good luck. So I don't think we are going to have interoperability at this stage. We are going to have just many data sets that are about the same, probably each of them different, but uh, in a way with some processing interoperable, but not out of the box. Requirements on SLA. Ah, I, I wish, but I don't, the directive does not specify SLAs. Martin, uh, what are the HPDs AC prefers to have from just special data sets? Okay, the only thing we know is that the directive has specified uh, six or seven target categories, one of which is geospatial data and one of which is meteorological data. Again, not strictly geospatial, but you know, I, would, I personally would see it close. I know people will disagree with me. Um, so there's no more detail than that at the moment. John Frick, I think you missed one question. Will there be a link between Inspire Annex 1.3 um, themes and high value data sets? I don't know. It's very likely that they will try to make it consistent. They, they would, we don't want them to be contradicting each other. Uh, it's very likely that whatever is already today mandatory under Inspire would be an easy win to be called an HVL data sets as well. So that's the obvious thing I would expect. Um, generally, I believe the commission is a personal opinion. I'm not talking uh, in name of, of the commission here. Um, I believe the in Inspire was very heavy on the practitioners, was very difficult, very, very strict when it came out. I believe high value data sets uh, wants to be a bit more relaxed from that point of view. Uh, also, the point about interoperability we made earlier. Um, the probably they are trying to get the data out faster and without perhaps the higher quality and interoperability standard you would have from Inspire, um, rather than waiting for this to be more perfect, if you can say that. Uh, still going through the question. Uh, Natalie, what I've noticed that it is not easy to map the Inspire themes and special data sets with the current EDP classification. Will you consider that in the future? That's an interesting one. Um, I'll suggest we continue this conversation offline. Uh, 
the there is a plan to do more in geospatial data because it is so such a large space but it's not something we can we should go in in detail now uh, but get back to us natalie because it is uh, a topic we want to deliver anyway uh thorsten we are currently experimenting with large-scale data harmonization in the context of these data sets in the frame of the OPEC project, uh, I guess on H2020. There are specific data sets in roadmaps that will underpin circular economy transitions. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, it's the point I made earlier. You're going too much in detail for what is available at the moment. Saulius, will commission suggest a generic open license agreement for HVDs like Creative Commons? Ah, that's a nice one. So the directive uh does not specify that uh in the same way the previous directive did not so there is a general requirement to the member states to publish it at open data but there is no strict definition of open data interestingly so you will see that some countries for example prefer uh, public domain or cc0 uh, some other countries pre prefer creative commons some other have their own uh, like britain has the uh, open government license Europe does not want, for the time being, to put their nose um, into uh, harmonizing the licensing as well. Well, I'm a, I'm a fast responder, am I? <laughs> <laughs> How far are discussion negotiation? Um, we don't. We cannot know. This is happening. Uh, I would say behind closed doors. Uh, the member states are involved, but we ourselves um, are not part of the process. Um, we will be consumer, let's say, of that process when it starts publishing its results. It's going to happen later this um, this year. And okay. Uh, time I end over. More questions no. coming in? No. Oh, wow. oh yes, there's one. Uh, Angela, keep my time. If we can keep more questions at the end, if probably. yes, we we do have a few more minutes. If you have time to. Um, to maybe answer um, Rink's question, how far are the discussions, negotiations going on with re in regard to the high value data sets? You're just saying it's a work in progress right now. Yeah, I mean, the as much as the concept is clear because it's written in law, uh, and of course in, in our work at the European Data Portal, we interact with the Commission systematically, we are not part of that process. So we are here in a way to help you prepare uh, but we we cannot we can only speculate about it and and Angela later will actually share some of our expectations but it's not something you should take a screenshot of and start working on because it's it's not something that is public yet um, uh, the and again if we I would keep the the remaining question for the end but just imagine yourself being part of this process and how complicated it is uh, the potential impact in some cases on the um, personal data sets, uh, the discrepancies in detail and granularity of the target um, data sets that may require significant investment from some of the countries in respect to other countries that perhaps are ready. Um, there, there, there would be a, a lot of negotiation that we are not seeing at the moment, and I, and I fully understand them. Um, so be patient a little longer, and our suggestion generally is simply to uh, to be prepared for when that happens and possibly uh, anticipating some of those moves. Um, but it's something perhaps for, for later, it's a conversation more for later. Anche, I would give it back to you. Okay, great. Thank you. So there's um, some comments from, from Jeff uh, from Luxembourg saying that they're choosing the Creative Commons but would be happy uh, to have strict indications from the European Commission and some more questions, but we will have time to um, to discuss some more uh, later on. So um, let's move on to the uh, to the interactive part now. And before that, um, let me just share my screen. Um, So here we go. My name is uh, Antje Kugler from Conterra. Um, sorry, I just got lost a bit. 
There we go. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have a virtual brainstorming session on which data set should be considered high value data sets. And before we do so, let's have a quick recap of what uh, Jean Franco was telling us about high value data sets. So here's a summary of the definition from the Open Data Directive, which uh, Jean Franco quoted earlier. Um, so high da value data sets can be reused to create value added services, which can have important benefits for society, the environment and the economy for a high number of potential beneficiaries. So um, it's, it's quite a broad um, definition. Uh, so the goal is to actually have benefits for society, the environment and the economy. And um, as Gianfranco stated before, it's not yet known to the public what will actually be considered high value data sets. So uh, at this point, it's a bit like looking into a crystal ball, but we'd like to do that anyway, uh, as a group with, the, um, with this brainstorming. And um, of course, we don't need to stand uh, to start uh, just from scratch because the Open Data Directive does list some thematic categories. Um, and I've, I've seen from your question, there's no mapping to the Inspire Annex themes yet. Um, and so um, there are six categories uh, that are being listed and also some examples what, uh, what type of data might fall under these uh, or might be understood uh, to belong to these categories. And uh, I'm not going to read all the examples, but uh, only the thematic categories. And the first one, which um, uh, I quite like, is geospatial. Second one is Earth observation and the environment, then meteorological data, statistics, companies and company ownership, and mobility. It's quite a broad spect a spectrum of thematic categories. And um, which uh, data sets could actually be considered a high value data bet, uh, set which uh, you find valuable and um, would be very uh, well suited to create uh, value added services. Um, we'd like to uh, do this in a Slido. I'll call it discussion. It's like a virtual brainstorming. Um, so I'd ask you to um, please go to Slido. Um, You've, uh, we've did we've done this um, we've done this before, uh, but now um, you you actually have um, um, have a thing where you, you can enter uh, some some input. So we'd like you to think about what you would consider a high value data set, and. Um, as participants enter the idea, ideas, and I see you're already starting to type, these will be listed and visible to all. So um, if you have an idea, you might uh, want to check if someone has already entered something that you, you wanted to add, and you can vote for this idea. And the most popular ideas will be listed on top. And um, we'll give you 10 minutes now to um, to input your, your ideas and then have some time to uh, go through all the ideas. And you see lots of people are already typing and uh, like you to, um, yes, start typing and reading yourself.
Okay, I have a feeling, oh no, there's still some <laughs> some inputs coming in, also some questions. So why don't we just um, start going through the li li list? You're still, uh, you're, you're quite uh, welcome to, to add more um, items if um, as, as you think of them. And uh, what you can also do is um, vote for um, if you find that um, uh, you agree with uh, what's what's being said. You can also place more than one vote for um, for certain ideas. Um, please feel free to do so, and they will be listed um, in the in the um, in the order which um, they're voted for. So the one on top right now is uh, actually quite a bit, uh, quite, quite a big list. Addresses, place name, administrative boundaries, uh, transport networks, uh, land. Actually, can I make this a bit smaller? Yeah, there we go. Land, land parcels and land cover. Uh, then we have high resolution soil and surface geology. Oh, someone saying inspire Annex 1, all of them. That's actually quite a bit, quite a few votes for that. Um, then traffic, air pollution, energy resources, also quite a few of votes. Energy consumption. Waste management data. Pollution and protective sites. Actually, while we're going through this, uh, I think the people who are very uh, familiar with uh, Inspire will see uh, there's a lot of overlap. And just um, so far, I see very few things that are not covered by um, by Inspire. Um, and we have transport networks, administra uh, administrative areas, and place names. All Annex 1 data, yes, we've had that before. Hydrometeorological data. Healthcare capacity of the different EU countries and their regions. Natural hazards. Public transport timetables and real-time updates. Oh, something just jumped. Um, geology, hydrogeology, mining, and geological hazards, hazards and climate risk areas, natural risk zones. I would love to see material, uh, material uh, materials database for asset life cycle and recycling potential. Mm -hmm. Geologic underground data salt domes, groundwater streams, green areas and their accessibilities in cities, standardized information of the official street maps, georeferenced information of industrial areas, energy resources and water, topographic database, uh, Inspire One and uh, Inspire Annex One that derives from the member states' authoritative data, Inspire Annexes 1 and 2. OK, so we see a lot of that. <laughs> I just got lost. Um, I think this is because of the voting. So if I skipped something, uh, I, I apologize for that in advance. There we go. Hazard and climate risk areas, um, data that is not strongly addressed by Inspire, especially, or example, health and energy, natural risk zones. Um, we saw these. Air quality, water quality, species distribution, waste distribution, all environmental reporting data, statistical, geospatial, and others. Bathymetric data, addresses and transport networks, Annex 1 data, uh, Annex 1 ex <laughs> except for the coordinate reference systems, um, which is not a data theme, so makes sense. UK soil data, including soil carbon levels and surface geology. 
digital roadmaps that include the current traffic signs and different traffic incidents, cycle lanes, addresses, place names, street name, transport networks, transport services, cadastral parcels, data sets con uh, containing combination of special objects contained in Inspire conformant data sets, geology addresses, uh, member states authoritative data. I think I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, I, I get, I'm getting the, the same things now, which are jumping up and down because of the voting. Um, exactly, health data. Data linked to economic processes. Agriculture. Very high resolution imagery. Reference base maps as an easy access uh, to geographic data. Sea regions, schools, recreation areas. Okay, I think I had those. Topography, autopho, um, that's a lot of uh, Annex 1 and 2 themes. Yeah, we've got recreation areas, schools, broadband, geographical reference information, Inspire 1 and 2. Entities information taking away with, uh, away with unique at identifying. Company census with ownership, including identity number, name, and address to identify. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, composition of product. Any data set that can be integrated into uh, easily into our current data sets and improve our models and insights. Okay. So there's more coming in now. Let's just move on. I'm, uh, you're still welcome to do some more voting. Um, but it seems like um, there are quite a few um, people who would like to see their, their uh, Inspire Annex 1 and uh, 2 themes or um, themes that, that we're actually already quite quite familiar with. But of course, there are some, um, some new ideas or themes that are not covered by, by Inspire there as well. Okay, great. So um, thanks for this. We'll leave it open uh, just for, for a few more minutes, uh, but maybe we can move over to um, your questions or comments on this. Um, so I would need someone else to have a look into the chat. or stop sharing the screen, wait. So there's a already a lively discussion going on. Um, looking for questions. Ah, oh, yeah, here's an, <laughs> an interesting comment. Oh rhetorical question so why will the inspire uh, why will the inspire annex 1 data now get flowing under open data law when it did not under inspire and uh, someone replying inspire does not apply to share freely and i think that's that's actually the um, one big thing um, that uh, inspire does allow for certain um, exceptions to be made for example um, copy well uh, copyright or um, if um, um, uh, yeah well there are different um, things that might restrict um, the free sharing oh yeah everyone agrees with that <laughs> so 
So I'm looking if there are any questions here. Because I think because of the um, because of the recording, um, I shouldn't be sharing the chat the chat because it shouldn't be recorded. Although of course you can all read it. Yeah, there's someone commenting geospatial is not a thematic category but a type that is applicable to all categories that's actually what i thought as well <laughs> that's this old discussion which uh, which data is actually um spatial and which isn't and a lot of people argue that um, most data is uh, does have a special content there oh yeah there's quite a few comments on that aren't uh, EO, meteorological and mobility, all geospatial. Okay, great. So we'd ask you to uh, please continue using the chat. It's uh, really interesting what's what's going on there, I guess. And um, we thought it would be nice to um, to have a quick break, five minute break for all of us uh, to, I don't know, get some coffee, run to, to the bathroom or whatever you, you might need to do. So um, we'd like you uh, to, to have you back in five minutes and we'll um, dis uh, dis um, continue with the discussion. Um, and we're going to uh, next look at uh, what lessons um, we might have uh, learned from Inspire that can help with the implementation of um, high value data sets. So I would ask you to come back in five minutes and we're going to, to have a quick break now. And in the time, also, you can still feel free to chat in the chat box and um, discuss with us or Anche and Gianfranco about any current or ongoing questions.
Okay, so let's let's go back from the break. Um, you can hear me right? Okay. So let's um, there's there's been some really interesting things going on in the chat, and we've also got some some questions that uh, I believe we have some time to to go through after this next interactive point. On, and that's um, that we would like to um, think about what lessons from Inspire um, could be useful for the implementation of high value data sets. And um, with an ambitious endeavor uh, such as building Inspire, there must have been quite a few lessons to have learned. I know I have. So um, many of you have probably uh, been involved with Inspire for quite some time. And uh, you've probably learned a lot in the process. And um, some of these things um, we would invite you to share any lessons from Inspire that could be useful for the implementation of high value data sets. So uh, we'd like to invite you to go back to Slido and um, yeah, think about um, um, think about um, lessons um, you've learned from Inspire and um, start typing and voting. First ones are already coming in.
Okay, let's start going through the list. Um, through the list here, of course, still um, welcome to, to keep adding things and, uh, of course, voting. Um, the one that seems to be most popular right now is the first one here. Technical specifications need to be simplified for non-specialist uh, data providers. The second one's similar. I think um, uh, data structures have to be easy. Then provide high quality data, uh, sorry, provide high quality central tools early in the process. Um, for example, the ETF validator was five years too late. Um, then complexity and requirements hurts a use of data in real businesses. A single national data set published by a coordinated process is better than multiple regional submissions. Yes, I think a lot of people would agree to that, and a lot do. It's been voted quite a few times. Focus on demand, uh, not a lesson from Inspire. <laughs> okay. Of course, you're welcome to um, to uh, to enter any um, um, any suggestions, uh, be they learned from Inspire or not. Um, some member states don't care, no matter how easy. Um, legislation helps to bring things forward, uh, voluntarily may, maybe won't do it. To define clear and few priorities. Skip the harmonization part to get started quickly. Unharmonized, uh, unharmonized data is better than no data. Quite a few people agree with that. One size, uh, one size does not fit all. Inspires too complex for data providers. No tools were available for a long time. The validation instrument should be easier to use. Many of the error reports are very cryptic. The specification and implementation much closer to each other so that technical choices are still relevant when implementation is finished. Focus on data needed for some use cases. Okay. I'll just keep scrolling down a bit. I don't think we have time to really read through all. Okay, great. We will uh, definitely uh, do an export of um, all these uh, results from um, um, and all your, your input and uh, publish it on the European Data Portal, uh, along with a short report of the session. And um, now that I see that here's some, some question as well, we can maybe move on to the discussion and the, um, some more questions. So here's one from Stefan. Um, if Inspire did not manage to provide interoperability and high value data sets um, does not aim to, how will this improve? So this is a good question. We should probably have a look um, at the chat. Or maybe um, Jean-Franco, do you want to take this? There's a, a general, um, let's say, line of thought from, from the messages I see that is um, why already inspire in a way sometimes did not provide to the public data that is good enough uh, or 
at the level of quality we would really need that is good for society. The way I see it personally is all a matter of incentives. Um, so the, the member states that, that believe that Inspire is useful, the member states that believe that open data is useful, will it's like they're invited to a wedding. Well, oh yeah, let's do it. Uh, uh, and perhaps they're doing it already. The, for the others, we'll be seeing just one more piece of legislation to be compliant with. Uh, and that I believe is the same problem we, we, we had with Inspire, we will have with uh, the H-value data sets. Uh, because of the extremely fragmented hetero heterogeneous picture that Europe needs to deal with, the requirements, the functionality, the functional specifications of those data sets will be inevitably a bit, in my, my expectation at least, a bit watered down, a bit diluted, not as strong as we would like them to be as professionals, as practitioners. But they are more than nothing. They are still a, st a step in the right direction. They change the culture over time. Um, some of you earlier in the chat was writing, why uh, don't we all use a public domain or why don't we even have a formal open data license written in the law? And the re only reason is that already at the time of Inspire, we were not ready. The culture was not there. Today, for most of us in this call, probably we are perfectly comfortable with the idea of open data. Try to do the same 20 years ago and see what happens. Um, times have changed slowly. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I made a little speech in the end. I'm sorry to answer the question. <laughs> I think that's uh, one of the questions that's being um, that's being asked. Uh, actually, uh, quite a few ch uh, questions in the chance uh, in the in the chat are going around that that um, that idea. Um, how about costs? Jean-Franco, do you know? Yeah, what so you... the um, there's a um, very common way of, a um, very easy way to see H-value data sets that is like a, a piece of national infrastructure. Like you, you, you have, I wonder, uh, how do you pay for roads? How do you pay for bridges, for, your, for the sewers and so on? For the police, you pay with your taxes. These data sets are considered so important that you don't need a specific funding. This is the idea. In theory, citizens through taxes will fund it. Um, the alternative would be uh, alternative business models for some of those member states or and agencies where data today is commercialized. Uh, it's very easy, for example, that ordinance survey uh, in the UK or cadastre agencies in general usually have uh, commercial products related to most of this data we would like to see open. Um, the My personal expectation is that they will just need to change their business model around and it will be painful at the beginning because it's, nobody likes change if you're forced to by someone else, but um, it will be a natural process. So um, if you, if you from the UK, you probably have seen the process by which Ordnance Survey, the cadastral agencies there, over many years has progressively pushed some of its products into the uh, license out as open data and some other they kept commercial. In some cases, they use the a bit antiquated, the, the, the let's say the old fashioned uh, freemium kind of model in which the some version of the data set is open and the better one is commercial. Now, this would still be possible under the new directive, you may still have the open version of the data set uh, that ticks the box of all functionality described in the law in the open and perhaps have the more granular version, the higher definition version, the updated every second version as commercial. Now, I'm not saying that I like it, but it's still legal. Um, and again, we go back to the point I made earlier, it's about incentives. The member, the member states, the agencies that really believe this can bring business and development and benefits for the citizens will probably not be there trying to say one euro here and there. Um, the others may just worry about ticking the box and, and, and get away with it. Some more questions um, actually there in, in this, um, in, in the Slido. Um, Here's one question about user stories. It says, uh, Inspire strategy should match the digital transformation process developing within the industry and the public services. Where are the important user stories? Um, 
Jean-Franco, that's probably a question. Um, can we can we expect user stories to um, to um, be part of the strategy um, from the Open Data Directive and part of of this um, list of uh, high value data sets? In a way, yes. So the our project has been working on this indirectly since five years ago. If you go to the European Data Portal, you will find something like 500 or more than 500 use cases of um, organizations, startups, companies that are using open data for at the core of their business. Um, now, this is not the scale of high value data sets. Uh, it's a very good idea, though, that perhaps the best way to educate the skeptics to what a difference having a high value data set uh, makes is to show how it is used and and how um, something that before was not possible suddenly became possible. There are great examples from um, France, for example, the, over, over the last few years, they opened up a lot of those registers uh, related to uh, street names and postcodes that we've named a few times today. Uh, and, and also those are considered uh, I believe reference tables, reference information, I believe they call them in France. Anybody from France will be able to help me here. Um, and nobody's arguing with that. I mean, they, they, the idea is clear now. And if you start a business in France, you know that will, data will be for you. Uh, if you start the same business in Ireland or in the UK, you need to buy the data set. Uh, that makes a difference. Uh, if we get those companies that perhaps a few years down the line have become bigger and have a good number of employees and, are, and have a sustainable business uh, to witness that they could start also thanks to saving those few thousands of euros on the Gazetteer of roads, that would be a nice story to capture, yes. Okay, thank you. I think we have just a bit of time. Um, Right here, there's an there was an interesting question. Um, ah, I lost it. <laughs> no, I did lose it. Yeah, here's one. Is the real politics with and behind high value data sets um, uh, to direct interoperability to a private uh, a private company issue? Mm, that's a difficult one. Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quite a few tough questions being yeah. asked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I like them. Um, can you can you say it again? Just want to think a little more about it. Mm -hmm. If the real politics with and behind uh, high value data sets is directing interoperability to a private company issue. Oh, ooh, okay. No, I, I don't think there is that intention. Um, I, at the same time, we know that most of the innovation is expected from private. So the my 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 personal opinion is that Europe is pushing in the direction not because they expect member states to use more of their data, but rather to have more um, entrepreneurs and companies being able to expand or improve their businesses thanks to that. If you go to uh, those reports I presented earlier in the presentation, you will see how a lot of the examples we present, uh, like in the economic report on the value of open data, actually comes from private sector. Um, and those perhaps makes a lot more of a difference than um, than the public. You may say, oh, it's obvious that the public sector uses reuses open data. It's less obvious than private does. Um, but yeah, I don't think there is a drive to help private sector in a way that is unfair or disproportionate, if that was the question. Okay, let's have a look at the chat. Uh quite lively but mostly discussions I think uh... there's a nice line um, I see a few people commenting on 
address data already not being in the in the hands of government anymore. So when, if, if remember I told you I was act, um, an activist in the UK at the time, uh, the postcode address file um, was still owned by the Royal Mail and Royal Mail was being privatized and we did not manage to stop that from happening. So the uh, a data set that at the time was uh, owned by the government, not open data, but owned by the government, was sold and made private. So it's difficult to recover it. And there were some plans to buy it back uh, a, few, a couple of years ago, I believe, but I don't think they went through. Um, Margaret from Ireland was also commenting that the, uh, the equivalent data sets, I believe, is owned by a private organization. So in those cases, probably there's not much we can do by using the directive as our instrument. It's more a matter of political will, perhaps, uh, to buy it back, which is feasible. It's technically possible, uh, but uh, again, it's, it's a bit of a long shot, isn't it? Okay, great. I think we can um, we can basically move up, wrapping up, um, wrapping up this session. Um, Jean Franco, any um, words before uh, we ask the participants to um, move back to Slido and um, finish with with one word or line on leaving? For, for me, um, I was happy in a way to see uh, a lot of my personal expectation as a data practitioner to be confirmed. What I'm most intrigued is uh, what we are forgetting about. So what, what is it that we are not even imagining it could be captured as a high value data set? And, and the, the potential for, for, for business and for improving the quality of, of citizens in Europe uh, is I strongly believe it is substantial and probably we need to go beyond the sliders, beyond the consultation and try to wonder what is it that people really need rather than perhaps starting from the data sets we know already. That is what I would like to see as a, as a sort of a process or an, as an attitude. Perhaps the next directive, uh, uh, instead of specifying data sets, uh, may specify what services we want to make to be, to be possible uh, and then walk backwards to what data is necessary. That's my hint and what I would like to see. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so yes, we'd like to um, invite you to wrap this up uh, just to um, uh, go back to Slido and um, just finish up with one um one line on leaving um you could for example um just um yeah add something that surprised you or that you uh, would have liked to add and uh, didn't have time or a question or whatever and um we'll be we were actually quite um quite happy about um, the lively discussions and um, the interesting um, inputs that uh, that you all did. So I guess this will be a very um, interesting uh, thing to watch um, within the next um, one and a half years to see how uh, the high value data sets will develop. We'll just leave this open for for a bit so it can still be in the recording.
Okay, this must be a first. We are actually uh, four minutes early, <laughs> but um, thank you so much. We had a great time uh, during this discussion. And um, what we'll do next is um, write a short, just um, report on on this um, on this event, uh, and it will be published on the European Data Portal. And of course, um, happy to keep um, with the discussion. Contact any any one of us uh, at um, Conterra or at um, um, at Cap Cap Gemini event. And um, yes, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.